Good morning. Let's all get ready. We're going to get the worship service started this morning. Let's all stand and we're going to sing, sing hymn 343, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that sings. first verse again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that has saved a wretch like me. You glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 Miss Shannon, where's Miss Shannon Berkeley? Is she here? I thought I saw her earlier. Anyways, okay. Um, hey, we're glad to have you. If you're visiting with us this morning, um, if you're visiting for the first time, I hope you got a little bag out front by the welcome committee. It's got a got a lot of information in there. If you got a visitor's card, we ask that you fill that out, and you can drop it in the offering plate. Or there's two boxes on the exterior, or as you go out the doors by the glass doors, you can drop your information in there. We would love to have your information so we can get back in touch with you uh, to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing here in Landmark and in this community and in the surrounding communities. 
We're so thankful that you're here. Members, we're glad that you're here as well, and I hope you came this morning with your hearts prepared to worship, not only in song, but also with the message of Brother David. At this time, we're going to go ahead and take our offering this morning, and Brother Mike, would you open us up in a word of prayer? to sing come now is the time to worship
you did come this morning to get ready to worship. I'm glad to have it. You excited about Jesus? Amen. 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 We're going to sing a, a, a fun song, and it's a good one, but man, it's got a wonderful meaning because when we die and we see Jesus face to face, we are going to see that mansion over the hilltop. Amen? amen. amen. Let's sing this. I'm satisfied with just a cottage we Yeah. 
if we go ahead and stand. We're going to sing goodness of God at this time. And I really do hope you understand that. And I hope that you do have the goodness of God in your heart.
of the goodness of God. Amen. Good morning. As you're standing up, I invite you to open your Bibles in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we continue to be reminded of His goodness, His love, His mercy. And we will be reminded again in this scripture that we're going to be reading this morning. 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to be reading from verse 88 through verse 23. Uh, but we will just read a couple of verses before we jump in. 2 Kings chapter eight, 6, verse 8, and I'm going to read through verse 8 through 12. It says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such place. And the man of God sent to, sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to him, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my king. But Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tell the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your presence. Lord, we uh, are grateful and we don't have the words uh, necessary, Father. We don't even find the right words to express our gratitude. Uh, Lord, we come with a joyful heart, uh, a humble heart, uh, willing to worship you and give you the praise and glory that you deserve. Lord, help us to understand that the battle is yours, that help us to see uh, your hand around us, Lord. And I pray that uh, when we walk out of this building this morning, Lord, as James chapter 1 reminds us, that we cannot walk away ignoring, ignoring what we've seen. Help us to make decisions, Father, that will bring the honor that you deserve. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's very hard to follow up with a series that talk about joy, and not necessarily because of what we will be talking about this morning, but it's because it feels like Brother Pete has done a great job, and through, the, through God's word, reminding us about what joy should be about. And you have all of these series and weeks, us being reminded about joy, 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 and then you find battle, and it's... That which life it's all about. We are here to be reminded about what joy is really about as we, as well as we understand that life may come, not so much joyful moments. And it's really hard, not hard, it's interesting that while preparing for this morning, also for Sunday school class, you find in the book of James and chapter 1 of that book, it simply closes with the statement that if you walk away from God's word, if you walk away from scripture, not making a change, not making a decision to do something radical about your life, you deceive yourself. You've seen who you are, you've been presented with the truth, yet you walk away, and not only you, we walk away forgetting what we've seen. But anyway, this chapter 6 of the book of 2 Kings, as a little bit of an introduction, so Elisha and the ministry that Elisha has in the northern kingdom of Israel, it's a ministry, it's a very important ministry. Elisha, his ministry was the most effective, and we still talk about Elisha and this prophet, not because he had it easy, not because his ministry was all about preaching a gospel of peace and love and money. But it's because when he spoke, he obeyed to what God's word was. And he delivered the message that God was trying to bring upon his people, Israel. And if you think about it, what a better time to be a prophet. What a better time to hear what God has to say than the times that we live in right now. 
the most way, the most effective way that you and I can be in, it's when we are needed the most. And I'm reminded because Matthew says, in the Gospels, Jesus says that we are the light of the world. In the middle of the day, you don't need a flashlight. You need a flashlight the most when it's dark. You need a message of peace and comfort, not where things are going nice and easy. You need a message of peace and comfort when you're not in those moments. And this is what Elijah and his ministry is all about. And for a moment, I thought you said verse 1 through 6. And, you know, the story about the axe sinking down into the water. And Elisha throws a stick up on the water. The axle head comes afloat. And I don't know about you, but last time I checked, axle heads don't float just on the water. And this is all pa painting a picture for you and I to be reminded that the battle is the Lord's. And whether you want to admit it or not, our natural limitations will never comprehend the supernatural power that he has in our lives. So the whole chapter is setting, us, is setting up a picture for you and I to understand that the battle is his. And when you think about Elisha, Elisha was a great messenger. Elisha was a prophet. And we, side note, we started watching Lord of the Rings yesterday. And I thought about the moment that a messenger is the most needed, it's when? When there is war. The moment that a messenger is the most important, it's when kingdoms need to send messages from one place to another. And to understand that Elisha fulfilled his ministry as a messenger is the same ministry that you and I have. God's kingdom would be effective when his messengers are able to do to re relay and to give the message that was given by Christ. Verse, I want you to take a look at verse 8 through 9. It says that now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and the king of Syria consulted with his servant, saying, my camp will be in such and such place. And the man of God, Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, saying, beware that you do not pass this place. For the Syrians are coming down there. I want you to see this morning the message of God. For you to understand that the battle is the Lord's. And I feel that we preached about it. We hear about it. We read about it. But for us to understand that the, mess, the battle is the Lord's and not ours. We first have to understand his message. And what is the message that we have to understand? That Christ has a message of protection. We are protected. Because it makes no sense to send out a messenger without protection, right? It's, it makes no sense to send out a messenger carrying a very important message without the tools, the protection, or the safety that he needs to deliver that message. You and I are the same way. We are messengers sent out, and yes, we have the tools necessary to be guarded from the attacks. I know what God's word does to my life. I know what God's word is capable to do to my day. The moment I wake up, it's the choice between getting on my phone or getting on my Bible. And I know the outcome because guess what? I'm as human as all of us, and I've done it. I know what my day looks like the moment that I get up and get on my phone. And I know what my day will look like the moment I get up and get on my Bible. So what's the difference? Why do, keep, why do I keep going on the opposite way? Well, I've seen it. I've seen the power. I've seen the effects that it's got in my, in my life. I've seen the supernatural power of God's word in my life. And this message of protection, don't think that the gospel and this that we do every day, it's only for salvation. Yes, it's the first step. The Bible says that God wants for all of us to be delivered and to be saved. But don't, under, don't think for a moment that that's where it stops. God wants for you and I to be protected from the attacks of the enemy. He wants for you and I to be ready when attacks may come our way. Elisha received a message from God and he delivered this message to the king of Israel. Imagine the frustration of this other king, the Syrian king, Ben Hadad, when he's getting ready to attack Israel, he's got his troops, his army, he's ready to come down, exterminate them. And they show up and there's nobody. 
Imagine the frustration. All because the messenger did his job. I think about when I saw the when I read about the frustration of this king, I thought about is my enemy frustrated with me? Have I used God's word to escape the attacks of the enemy? Or have I let myself so open and wide open that he is not even frustrated with me? Have I put myself in the danger, in the path of danger and attacks just because I do not put my trust in his message? And this is a great reminder. Don't ever think that just because it's in the Old Testament or in the Bible. We all know that. This, God's word still has the same power that it did five, six hundred years ago. So what's the difference? Why do I keep myself letting open to the attacks of the devil? Why if I know that something is going to happen during my day, why do I choose to be on my phone instead of reading my Bible? It's all about how we use the tools that we've been given from God. Look at verse 9 of this chapter. It says, And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware, do not pass this place, for the Assyrians are waiting there for you. Verse 10, Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And guess what? It didn't happen once. It, it has not happened twice. Something, this event had happened for so many times that this king, the king, the Syrian king, was so frustrated because every time he wanted to attack Israel, they were not there. They were prepared. They knew what was coming, and they were prepared for it. You cannot have joy in your life if you're not prepared when the battle comes. Because when the battle comes, and we're fixing to see it in a couple of verses, verses when the battle comes, our eyes are only focused on what we're is surrounding us. Our eyes are focused on what we see in front of us. Every time I spend some time doing some research in the Old Testament, and every time the Bible speaks about God's presence with man, it's a, it speaks in a different words when you see it in the New Testament. And what I'm trying to say is that every time in the Old Testament, God walked with man. It says that God was with man. He was there with Adam and Eve. He was there with David. He was there with Moses. But every time you look the same examples in the New Testament, it says that God was in man. And I think about it. When we get to heaven and we ask Moses, you know, like, hey, what was it to, what was it to receive the Ten Commandments? You know, what was it to... Follow this big old pillar of fire. What was it to follow this cloud? Moses would probably be like, it was, you know, it was just like following a pillar of fire. But tell me, what was it to have God inside of you? What would we say? Would we ask David, were you afraid when you threw the stone to Goliath? And he'd be like, yeah. But you tell me, what was, God, what was, what was it like to have God inside of you? What was it to be the dwell, indwelling presence of God. What was it like to be the temple of God? Because we had to carry it. We had to put it up and put it down. You were the temple. Tell me, what was it like? And sometimes we don't realize how blessed we are in our days. And I don't, if you walk away this morning from here, don't think that, please don't, I'm not making it sound like not our pains, not our struggles. Because this past week, it's been, a, it's been a hard week. Uh, we are to come alongside each other, to suffer and to hurt for each other. And I've seen the pain in people. I've heard the stories. I've been there. I've not walked those steps. And while I'm not trying to say that life, it doesn't care whatever happens in our life, why we, if we instead focus on what the promises of God are. Yes, life is hard, and if somebody ever tells you that just because you're a Christian, you don't have the right to be either in pain, hurting, or depressed, or suffering, probably send them to Brother Pete's office. But don't stay in there. We have a hope. There is a hope for each and every one of us, and we know it. 
So is it better to focus on our circumstances, on our natural circumstances, or is it better to focus on our supernatural powers? That supernatural that we, you and I know. There is only one good thing that I know that it can come out of pain. And I always mess around with my wife, you know, because I'm the type that's got to be strict and you do things just because you have to do it. And, you know, I got to be the macho, right? But there is one only good thing that I know that it can come out of pain. And pain helps us as a reminder. And I always tell myself that pain serves as a reminder. What's the reminder of pain? It's telling me, it's asking me if what I'm chasing after is it really worth it. It reminds me, it, I don't like to get up at four in the morning, but I know somebody's going to be upset if I don't get up at four in the morning. But it reminds me, is it really worth it? The answer is yes, it is worth it. It's the same in life. When we follow and chase after the things of God, pain will come, suffering will come. The question is, is it worth it? And it's for each and every one of us to respond to that question. I think of, I try to be as cool as I can, I guess, with the students, because I want to develop a relationship with them. I want them to be able to trust me. I want for them and I to have a good relationship. But in moments of deep, extreme pain, I don't expect for them to come to me. I know that. Because in moments of deep, extreme pain, I know they will go to their parents. And that's okay. Because that tells us that in moments of pain, who we turn to really shows who is first in our heart. Then it's the same question in our walk with Christ. Do I turn to him every time that I'm in pain? Or do I walk away from him? What's the reminder? What's that question in my heart? Is he really the one and only? Reading through this book, not a fan. The author asked the question, would my wife be okay if I tell her that she is one of the many that I love? And I'm like, I don't even think that I want to ask that question. But what do I tell God? Is God my one and only or he is one of my loved ones? Because the Bible, Jesus says that he told his disciples that to love him, they had to hate others. And not necessarily, it doesn't mean that we have to hate our loved ones. I don't have to hate my wife, my family, my friends. But when it comes to Christ, my love for him should not compare to anything else. And that's a reality check for me. Because is my love for Christ stronger than my love for my wife, my family? That's a question for each and every one of us. And that's the message. God has a message of protection for you and I. He is telling us to not do things in our lives, not just because he doesn't want us to do it. It's because he's warning us. The moment you do it, you will be attacked. Don't do it. But then it comes the stubbornness, you know? It comes verse 11 through 14. It says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. His attacks were all worthless. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He was so frustrated that he even thought that he had a mole in his people. He thought that somebody was being a spy on him. And giving this information to the other, to the king of Israel. Look at verse 12. It says, And one of, these, one of his servants said, Not my king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That's kind of, I mean, that shocks me. Because does God know everything, even what happens in my bedroom, my heart, when I'm alone? When nobody's watching, yes, he does. Verse 13 says, And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. If you're paying attention and if you are following with me, I know it's hard to follow with the accent, but if you're following with, the king of Syria is trying to attack Israel. His efforts are, they're not working. They're, 
he's being ineffective. And he still comes up with the idea that he is going to go and take out the messenger that is advising the king of Israel about the plans that he is making. Doesn't that sound like you and I? Because while I see God acting around my life, some, somehow I think that I can beat him, beat him at his own game. I think that I can outdo God. And I think that I can do something better. Because, oh God, look, ahead of me, something is going to happen. So I need to get in control of the situation. Because you don't know, what, you don't know what's going on. You have no idea what's going on. I see this in front of me, and I need to do it. I need to take care of it. You know, sometimes, I mean, the king of Assyria is not that much different than you and I. I, th I thought of this sentence that I guess we all say that, oh, bless your heart. You know, poor king of Assyria. He thinks that he's been trying to attack Israel. And once, twice, three times, four times, he's got, he couldn't do it. And he thinks that God will allow for him to capture his messenger. And even if he does, is God not able to raise up another messenger? So what is this king trying to do? What am I trying to do? Thinking that I know better than God. Thinking that I can do better. Because in the pursuit of happiness and my joy, I can do, I can commit one of the greatest mistakes, and is to bump him into the passenger seat. Because in the pursuit of my self seeking preservation and care and joy, I think that I can take control of, the, of my life. Look at verse 14. So the first thing is the message. I want you to see that the battle is the Lord's because of his message. Second thing I want you to see is his promise. Verse 14 through 18 says, Therefore he sent horses and chariots. The king of Syria sent horses and chariots to capture Elisha. And a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Verse 16 says, So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, bless his heart. Oh, I'm Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. What is the promise that God, God is giving us? It's a promise of faith will triumph over fear. And it, it is hard. And I, again, I don't want it to make it sound that the pains we endure in life are regardless and that we shouldn't worry and pay, you know, take, pay attention to it, those things. But Elisha reassured his servant that God's presence was there with them. Do we truly know that? Is there really in our heart that you and I know that God's presence is with you, even though you may not see him? You may not feel him. You may not see him. But you know what? I thought the same question. I thought of this question. Wouldn't it for me be easier to follow God if I am able to see him? If I could see Jesus Christ sitting next to me, Every time I go somewhere, I would say, well, it would be way easier. But what if my eyes were open to the spiritual realm? And what if I, while I can see him, what if I also see the attacks of the enemy in my life? Will I still be focused on him sitting next to me? Or will I be focused more now on the attacks that now I can see? Because I could say, oh, if I could see you, if I could feel you, if I could hear you. Yeah, but what if I could see the other attacks going on too? Would I still be faithful? I don't think so. I really don't. Because I would be more focused on what's going on outside. And that's the principle of faith. 
Hebrews, I thought of Hebrews 1.14. You know, it says, the scripture says that angels are there to minister to you and I. We are surrounded. We are protected. So what's the issue? Where is our trust? Is it in our own strength? Or is it in Christ? When we let fear and outward circumstances take control over our moment, our peace, and our joy, the one that we talked about every Sunday morning, may be stolen. And you and I can come here Sunday morning and be reminded of peace, be reminded of joy, be reminded of all the truths of the Bible that you and I know. But if we walk away not paying attention to any of those, James 1 comes up to my mind. James 1 said, you deceived yourself. If you come here Sunday morning with the attitude of worship, praise, trusting in the Lord, giving to Him what He deserves, but then you walk away, guess what? You looked at the mirror, you saw the problem, and you forgot all about it. In his promise, we got protection. protection. We are protected. We know that we are. But with protection and when things come our way, the first thing that I feel that we use it as a band-aid, you know. People go through circumstances. James is just a book, a good book, by the way. If you haven't gone through the book of James, just go through it. Like, you'll get spanked, but it's all right. It says that if you tell somebody to pray, simply pray about it and do nothing, guess what? You pretty much do nothing. But one of the things that we do when people go through trials and tribulations and problems is that, oh, you know, you pray about it. You're supposed to pray about it. And you all probably are going to get mad at me, but you'll give me 10 seconds. You want to know how important is prayer in our life? Let's schedule a time of instead of regular worship for prayer. And let our actions speak. And I say this out of love because I am in the same group. We think of prayer like that emergency box. And it's so hard when we're in that circumstance, that moment, that, oh, we believe so much in prayer. And we want to pray and we get down on our knees. But once the moment is gone, we put it away. It's stored. Until, until next emergency. And look at the prayer that Elisha, and that's why it's so important. Our prayer life determines many of our many of the actions we take upon our life. And look at verse 17 and verse 18 says, verse 16 says, So he answered, Do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Elisha was so spiritually aware that he could see beyond his natural limitations. He could see through his spiritual eyes. He saw that supernatural army surrounding them. And probably if you're like me, I was expecting a little, bit, a little bit more of like a Elijah type prayer. You know, instead of blindness, I was hoping for like fire and brimstone coming down from heaven. But he prays for blindness. But prayer is so important, not only because we show him that we trust him in prayer. It gives us the ability to sit there patiently, to wait you notice that Elisha didn't pray for fire to wipe out the enemy. Could have prayed for it? He could have. But he understood that there was a greater message. And by no means I say this. But sometimes the circumstances we go through our life are for ministering to others. And as crazy as it may sound, prayer is so important. That when you're able to be with somebody, have a prayer partner, look what happened. Elisha's servant panicked. He's like, what's around? He probably got up, got outside of the tent. He probably went to do some business. And he saw the surrounded that entire army. And he ran back in. They're like, we're about to be wiped out. Look at Elisha. He comforted him. It is important that you and I find somebody that can pray for and with us. You, why? 
Because sometimes you may not find the words necessary to pray. Sometimes you may not see, you, you may not even know what to pray. Sometimes you may not even want to pray. But when you have somebody praying there alongside you, look what Elisha did. He prayed for his servant's eyes up to be opened. And then he was able to see God's presence. And then he was able to be comforted. And then he received that peace. It is extremely important for us to have that in our lives. Let's stop focusing from Elisha and let's look at the servant. The circumstances around overwhelmed him so much that he did what you and I would have done. He responded to his natural senses. He simply saw an army and he panicked. Surprise, all of us do. You hear somebody in your family is going through a difficult time, we all panic. You see a friend going through a hard time, we all panic. Because we don't know what to, what to expect. We don't know what's ahead. And I've said it. That doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or a nice, smooth ride. But when you understand that his plan, he's got a bigger plan. And that he's using that either to make you stronger, to minister to other, others, or so that he gets the glory, our perception of things will change. You see, joy, we may talk and preach and speak all about it, but it starts from our heart and our willingness to yield. If we don't yield, have you tried riding a horse that doesn't, wanna, doesn't want you on top of him? It's hard. You, I mean, I've tried it and I'm to the point that I'm even going to hurt the horse, but he's got to wait. It's, if you don't yield to Christ, it's not going to, even if you do, sometimes some, somehow we have created the idea that being a Christian, it's all going to be nice and easy. And it's not. But when you understand that God is surrounding you and that he is protecting you, you will see situations in your life in a different way. Look at verse 21 through 23. It says, so, verse 19 says, so Elijah said to them, this is not the way. Okay, verse 18, sorry. So when the, when the Assyrians came down to, to Elisha, he prayed for, to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Verse 19. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor this is the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Verse 20. So it was when they had come to Samaria... That Elisha said, Lord, open now the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened the eye, their eyes and they saw. And they were inside of Samaria. Elisha prayed for confusion. Their eyes were confused. It is not that they were blind. They just, their minds were confused. And this great army that came down to take Elisha out, they were going to kill him. It's confused. Elisha himself leads the army into the middle of the city where now they are surrounded, defenseless, and they could probably be wiped out. And Elisha prays, now, Lord, open their eyes. You know, there, this just simply says, what's, you see the message of God, which is protection. He wants to protect you and I. You also see his promise. But you also see his mercy. How we have been received in mercy is the same thing. And I can so see, I can easily see it right here. The enemy is in the middle of the city. You could destroy them. You could pay them with every intention that they were trying to hurt you. Yet they're being offered a feast, taken care of, and then sent away. Later on, this leads for the king of Syria, to give Israel a break. But pay attention to what happens in our life when we yield. And we know this. When we let God be fully in control, we turn evil in good. 
We don't. God does. God uses situations in our life that are painful, evil, hurtful, and he turns them around for his glory. For a powerful, great testimony. For a better preached message than any of us could. When he is in control of those things. The promise that he, and I, that he has given to you and I, it's a promise of peace. It's a promise of comfort. It's a promise of joy. Our lives may be, we've said it, our lives may be the message that somebody has, could ever hear. And all of this to say that don't give up in the battle. Because the battle is not yours. So don't get exhausted fighting it. Don't get all tired trying to carry all the weight. It's not yours to fight. It's the Lord's. Let him take control of the battle. I saw this video, and I could have not probably said it in a better way. But it said, Goliath mocked Israel for 40 days. And then on day 41, David took him up. For 40 days and for 40 nights, 40 nights, it rained. And then the rain stopped. Israel, it was in the wilderness for 40 years. But then guess what? Year 41 came. All this to say, don't give up. Throw your fears, your pain, your suffering at his feet. And he will take care of this As our music team comes up here. There is a message for us to be saved. There is a message of protection to trust and rely on, and lean on him. There is a message of kindness and love and redemption. But all of that won't take place until you let him do it. Lay it down at his feet. Confess it with your mouth. Because one thing is to want it from the bottom of your heart. One thing is for you to want the peace, the joy, the calm that he can give. And another thing is to bring it to him. To say it to him. We will have families on the side of the altar this morning. Because there is power when you pray with one another. There is relief when you find that strength in one another. So I invite you to stand up, close your eyes. And if you have something waiting on your heart this morning, come down and lay it at his feet. Don't carry it any longer. You don't have to. As we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the world Sir.